Hello, everybody. Um, this evening, I'm going to talk about some personal research I've been doing in a very small area of East Dulwich, and I'm looking at its Victorian housing in particular. And um, my area contains about 300 properties. Um, I'm loosely looking at three periods from around about the 1880s onwards, the Victorian period, the mid in the 1970s and 80s, and then the 2020s, which is the main part of my research. I'm mainly looking at the two up, two down, uh, originally about 60 square meters house, which in feet, Square feet is about 646. Most of the housing in the study area is about 150 years old. Now, the main aim of my research is a technical assessment of the future life of the housing. But this evening, I'm going to talk about um, the fact that a house is not just bricks and mortar and it is a home, um, and Ernest Newton, a Victorian architect, who was mainly interested in country houses, and I don't think he was really talking about the small terraced house, thought that there was a sacredness of home life, separating work and home and having a garden. And it's an aspiration that most people many people want. Um, it's an aspiration, it's to do with status, family life, having a front door, and for some, of course, it is the major investment in a household's life. And I wanted to know from in my study area, in the 300 properties that I'm looking at, who's lived in this housing? Where did the household come from? Why? live in a Victorian terraced house? That was for later questioning. And how was the housing looked after over its 150 years existence? And to some extent, I talked to people about why come to East Dulwich. My study area is at the end of that blue pointer, the tiniest area at the bottom of the, um, the the mitre of or, or the uh, triangle or the flat iron part of, of the Stullage area. And my study roads include Jennings Road, Goodrich Road between Landcroft and Crystal Palace, Goodrich goes for many a mile, Thompson Road, Pellet Road, Rodwell Road, Heber Road, and I'll come on to later why these particular roads. So as you can see, it is a very small area, but I am just one researcher. So let's start with the Victorian period. Um, and uh, I found these very interesting maps. May many of you may well have seen these before. Um, and in 1871, there's this map of St. Giles where there's hardly any housing. There is, and at the top of the picture, or of the map under the 1871 heading, you can start to see the loose green housing, a significant uh, sort of coming, starting. And between the B and the E, there's a very interesting brick field. So I have to surmise that quite a lot of the bricks probably to build the housing came from there. But it's only around about 20 years and we're into 1894, and all that housing is there. It's it's just amazing what I suppose we look at the city skyline and wonder what's in the the gap in which a tower block suddenly emerges. But but the the extent of the building in the sort of 20 years in this East Dulwich area was uh, was <laughs> quite amazing. Anyway, over those 20 years, um, of course, the housing was being built 
on land that was formerly open land, orchards, farmland. We have a whole load of um, uh, August uh, Victorian gentlemen, some of whom you might know, uh, commenting on what was going on in the development of the East Dulwich area. And we have W. H. Blanche in his account of the parish of Camberwell writing about carcasses of buildings in Lordship Lane, speculative builders, an eyesore to the locality and buildings of unworthy potential. Uh, William Morris, uh, you know, said the housing in towns is becoming a byword of contempt for their ugliness and inconvenience. And writing about London city suburbs, Percy Fitzgerald looked southwards and says, you know, the city suburbs as they are today, housing rows of gross, shabby looking houses. So, so even as they were being built, people had a very negative view of the housing that was uh, was going up. And John Ruskin, <laughs> which is why I referred to Goose Green, was talking about the rural barbarism of Goose Green and Cockney vandals coming from the middle of London. And what a pestilence of them houses, an unseemly plague of builders, as if the bricks of Egypt had multiplied like lice and unlighted like its locus has fallen on the suburbs of loathsome London. Walter Besson, a writer and social commenter, um, talked very strongly and from the heart about not only destroying the former beauty of South London, but his great fear was that this beauty, this open land, wouldn't be remembered. But not everybody and live on the top of uh, Denmark Hill in a beautiful mansion house, um, as Ruskin did, while he looked down towards Goose Green, commenting on the housing that was being provided for people who aspired to move out of the centre of London. There were many novelists around this time writing uh, on the area, and I just chose these two because there's, and George in his year of the Jubilee, wrote about the upper class in Champion Hill and the middle class in Grove Vale, Camberwell. But contrasting his writing about the middle class, Sean Bullock, in his novel of Robert Thorne, a bit later on, but describes the life of a clerk struggling to live. He started off in Vauxhall, moved towards the Herne Hill area, but living in grotty, multi-occupied housing. So, so let us turn to Pellet Road. And I hope this is a very fuzzy photograph from Southwark Archives, but I hope you can see in the middle, there's a horse-drawn bus going up the middle of Pellet Road. So it must have turned off Lord Pitt Lane. And I would like you to note the corner uh, shop uh, to the right of the bus. So, um, I was not the first researcher looking at East Dulwich, and I just want to sort of cover the fact that Charles Booth, who was studying uh, and, and estimating poverty for the whole of London, as it was then, uh, and mapping the prevalence of poverty, by colour coding the streets. And red is for the rich. So I hope you can see that's, uh, that's Boval Road, in Lord Chip Lane in the red on the map. And black is for the direst of poverty, but you can't, there isn't any black in this picture. Um, most of the sort of the triangle of East Dulwich that in which my study area is, is a mixture of, uh, sort of poverty and comfort. And he used um, his researchers, he used uh, talk to um, schools and the police, and they did some interviews. And for my study area streets, 
um, there's some very interesting but obviously very subjective comments about the individual roads. So that Pellet Road was a mix of more poverty than comfort, although some people were buying their houses. Heber Road was a mix of comfort and some poverty, where people weren't allowed to take in lodgers. Rodwell Road was a mix of comfort and some po poverty, and the comment is made that two women live here. Jennings Road was comfort mixed with poverty on both sides, um, but there must have been um, empty properties um, because uh, the comment is made that uh, there's properties to let, but the rents have been raised. So Goodrich Road was very poor on the odd side, and that's blue on the map. So down the bottom there. And it was working class comfortable on the even side. On the south side, semi-detached houses where people mainly own their own homes. So it wasn't all rent. Although in the population of the time, in the Victorian times, about many more than 90% of the population rented. And they commented there that there were two very poor houses by the public house, and which public house it was, which end of the road. And Thompson Road was comfortable both sides of the road. Anyway, so, so who was living in these uh, properties? My 300 study area properties. Um, in 1901, uh, there were more than 400 households living in those 300 properties. So although, although they were built for single family occupation, most people couldn't afford the rents. And uh, the households would include relatives, lodgers and visitors. In Rodwell and Pennick Roads, Average household size in 1891, by calculation, was sev over seven people. Uh, London's average in 2020 about 2.7 people. In all roads in 1891 and 1901, there were houses with 10 or more people. And I'll ask you to remember that some of the houses were quite literally, when they were built, rooms up and two rooms down. And in 1901, I found one house where there were 16 people plus seven children, and that was in Dunning's Road. I think the children were possibly being looked after, but but if there were different, the, the houses had different households, they weren't necessarily related. Sometimes they were, but they weren't necessarily related. So, you know, the, the reason why I was interested in the occupation of the houses is that of course it has some effect on the wear and tear of the fabric of the house. So then I looked at uh, what were the, where did the heads of the households uh, come from? Now, in the Victorian censuses, they ask for place of birth. They don't ask, where have you come from? So, so I've no way of knowing whether they were fleeing the slums of the middle of London. But heads of households were born in practically all the counties of England in the households that I was looking at. And there were heads of households from Germany, Scotland, Ireland and from Wales. And uh, there were properties where there was a household headed by someone from Bermuda, from India and from Denmark. So you can see it's a sort of, you know, even in my 300 small area study, um, a, you know, a, a sort of mix of people. And interestingly, in 1891, 16% of the heads of households were women, so single women, and some were living off their own means. We'll come on to uh, what what the other women were doing. There's a wealth of data in these old You could probably look and get a very good picture of what everybody in the household was doing. In the main, if the head of household was working, the women, the wives weren't, but the children might have been. So th th there's a lot of information there. So what were these occupations? I mean, throughout the years of the census that I looked at, one third of the head of household were involved in the building industry. 
makes sense, doesn't it? Including two residents in just in my study area who were each employing 20 builders. But the area had white collar workers and they included clerks, aforementioned policemen, nurses, teachers, uh, accountants, insurance, communication workers. So things like printing and journalism and the telegraph and PO is the post office. Um, people were working in, in those areas. There were a small number of heads of households who were employed in carrying and transportation and uh, car men, coal men, milkmen, bus drivers, conductors, railway inspectors and porters. And there were remnants of the old jobs. So there were lamplighters, grooms, coachmen, servants. And from 1881, there started to be an increasing percentage of heads of households that were working in commerce and manufacture and retail. But the women um, who were having to uh, look after themselves uh, were charring, laundering, sewing, beading, um, or, or were cooking. And in Heber Road, for all the years uh, 1881, 1891 and 1901, I don't know whether it was the same live-in servants, but there were five live-in servants. And what, what I thought would, is interesting, but was from this one tiny little area um, were people who were still working on the farms. So there were cattle drovers, labourers, dairymen. There were people that were working on the country estates or the big houses. So there were grooms, coachmen, gentlemen's help, gardeners, servants. Um, there were people that were going up. So there were dockers, people that identified themselves as warehousemen and marine storekeepers. Now, some of those dockers and warehousemen may well have been working along the Surrey Canal, which would have been there in, in those days. But um, uh, but there were still dock workers. And of course, there were the Surrey docks up, up in that round corner. There were factory workers because behind the docks, you've got the factories, you've got the packers, the couriers. My husband didn't know what a courier was. Furriers, skin dressers. Because if you think about it, Bermondsey had a very big leather industry, but there were tea brokers. So there was tea coming in and coffee, wine merchants. Indeed, Ruskin's dad was an importer of port from Portugal. So that's where their money came from. And then there were people going up to the city and you print workers and clerks and people with books, points brokers. And as time went on, the journalists. So from that tiny area, um, all this was going on. Um, let's move to the 20th, mid 20th century. Um, and I'm, my, my time periods are a bit loose. Get the information from. But do you remember that corner shop that was alongside the horse drawn bus? But well, it was still there in the sort of 40s and 50s. And what a splendid shop it was. Um, but by the time we get to 1986, it's Elsie's shop. And I, I can only think that Elsie was a hairdresser. And I don't remember it in 1986. I ought to, but I, I don't know. It, does, it looks a bit sort of... But it's the same. It's the same thing. And can you see on the side wall there, there's the advert. For the which is still there, the linseed oil from the hardware store. Anyway, the views of East Bullage in the 1970s were still worryingly negative. So we have Nicholas Pevsner, the architectural historian, who wrote in 1968 that outside the college estate, dull, late 19th century urban. Um, a chap called Michael Bartholomew who wrote a sort of pamphlet. It was a book, it was a penguin book, but a sort of pamphlet on a guide to where to live in London. I don't remember using it in 1971, but it was about buying and renting. And he only mentions East Dulwich as where the homes were cheaper than the Colts area. 
And there's, <laughs> there's this wonderful book by Doris E. Pullen in 1982, who writes about, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, it's beautifully illustrative on the, the main Dulwich estate area, but she ends her book um, by a, a, on almost the very last page before you get to all the appendices and East Dulwich. And here she refers to little streets of back to back houses. Now, I think that's somebody that hasn't been out of London, but because um, they're certainly not back to back houses, but they are little houses, never mind. So in the 70s, there was this sort of view that, uh, oh, have I? Oh, yes, no, and before I move on, the most damning um, view of Victorian health that I've been able to find has been Paul Thompson, a, another hot architectural historian in a Penguin book on the history of English architecture, who in writing a chapter about uh, the Victorian era, talks about no one will be sorry when the six million uh, nationally, Victorian houses still in use will have followed the mud and timber huts, medieval pe peasantry, and the reeking rookeries of the Georgian towns into oblivion. What a damning, uh, you know, <laughs> when, when one architect says, well, a house is a home and it represents status and aspiration, and then somebody says, well, it all, they all need to be knocked down. Anyway, Dulwich in the 70s was a bit city, and I thank Sharon for this photograph. This terrace isn't in my study area, but it sort of shows that when you're making a, a, a film noir crime thriller, um, you have East Dulwich as a backdrop. To it. And this was, I don't know whether any of you have seen Mona Lisa, it was, it was actually um, released in 1986. Bob Hoskins in the front there, it's a bit, a bit hazy, and Robbie Coltrane, the late great, um, as his sidekick. So, so you know, so we so we got to the, you know, the houses are a hundred years old in in the middle of East Dulwich, and people are still sort of have very negative views about them. And I have to say that in the middle seventies, in East, Housing in East Dulwich in some areas was in a very bad way. And the Borough Development Department, as it was called in those days, not just planning, was already doing research on the whole area of East Dulwich and mainly on how to improve the environment, the traffic, the parking, the street scene. But the older housing in, in this area and Southwark generally was under threat. And many of you might remember Toby Eckersley. I mean, I remember him from the Southern Housing Committee when I worked there. But he was chair of the London Association for Housing. And he as, is recorded as remembering a meeting in the 1970s when the then chair of Housing Committee and the director wanted to demolish housing in East Dulwich. Uh, apologies for the asterisk there, it's, it's, it's just a reminder, because I know I worked for both of them and I know that that was their view about some of the housing, um, you know, that was in quite a bad way. But they were, uh, you know, the, the whole national uh, housing policy scene was changing around this time and there was a view that the, the, the sun clearance programmes had more or less been done in London. Um, the clearance of older housing to redevelop with flatted estates was being challenged a bit. There was disenchantment with living in modern council housing, especially after 1968. Some of you might remember the collapse of Roman Point Tower Block. Uh, because of a gas explosion. Uh, and flooded estates are not ideal for families with children. But there were big questions about what do you do about the deteriorating older housing in inner city areas, especially when a lot of it was in owned, uh, owned and run by private landlords. And there were an awful lot of 
or tenants residents in these areas. The improvement grant system, which was started in the mid 40s, 1946, uh, was not working well. And around this period, and I'm not going to go into housing acts, but around this period, there were two significant elements of housing acts. So the 1969 Act introduced the concept of environmental improvement areas. And I and also the 1974 Act, which is to this talk, introduced housing action areas. So the idea of the environmental improvement areas was that the council should invest in the areas a bit to encourage residents living in areas, defined areas, to do up their housing um, and to make the areas more attractive. In the housing action areas, uh, there was no point in tossing up the environment if the housing was falling down or it was in very serious uh, disrepair. So how the housing action areas were five-year limited uh, defined areas in which you would look at the, the housing and, and get it improved as well as helping the poorer ter tenants. And um, that borough development uh, department research was public in this report, some of you might have seen it. I've not, I've, I've never seen the little castles in somebody's garden anywhere, but this report. And the significance of this report, my research and, and interest, was that they identified a sub area four, and you're recognizing, I hope by now, the sort of triangle towards south, uh, in which which contained the housing in the worst condition and households needing help. And it, although it's a blurry map, the significant aspect of it is that everywhere marked in black was pretty bad housing. Okay, so from this, um, the council decided to spare the Pellet Road housing action area. It was declared in 1975. The roads in this area were Wakeley Road, Sylvester Road, Pellet, Rodwell, and Heber, and contained about 300 properties. Now, that's why I said to you that, um, that the last two maps helped me to determine where my study area would be. So I chose the southern part of this map, so the, the housing sort of right in the triangle there, and half of the roads in the housing action area to be my study area. Um, that's how. So what were the conditions in the housing action area? Nearly half the households in the area were renting from a private landlord. Private landlords lack the will or the resources to invest in the repair of their properties. Many of the poorer tenants were older households older even than I am, and two-thirds of the household had, were experiencing very serious problems with their housing. So there's dampness, windows, roofs, chimney stacks, external brickwork, you name it, the houses were in a very poor state. 27% of households only had an outside WC. We're talking about the 70s, late 70s here. 35% had no or only shared use of bath or shower, and 10% of the households lacked running hot water. 12% of families were overcrowded. They could move if they want. Well, you know, they were going to be helped if they wanted to. The thing is that I was working in this area, but I was also uh, running a voluntary organisation that took out housebound older people. And I certainly went into those houses where there were older people, maybe sometimes severely disabled, living in ground floor flats with no central heat, no hot running water, and the loo outside. So, but, so the council's action in the area was to improve the housing, taking account of the residents' wishes not to force them out of their homes 
a residence association was formed for consultation. There was a staffed local office in Wakey Road. It was about two houses up from, you know, the, the bathroom bells shop in Lordship Lane. There were more generous improvement and repair grants for owners of properties plus advice. And where private landlords couldn't or wouldn't do up their properties, the council used its powers to compulsorily purchase, to acquire and rehabilitate the housing and also involved housing associations with their uh, resources to, to take on some of the housing area as well, to ensure that uh, the housing would stay at affordable re uh, rent. There were improvements to the environment, street trees, paving, tidying up corners. And it was an interesting project because the government was, was monitoring um, how housing action areas were working in the Ellet Road housing action areas was one of, one of these areas. So, independent um, survey research firm uh, talked to the residents about what they liked and disliked about the area. And it's quite nice that people thought that it was quiet, there were good neighbours, there was a very strong attachment to the area because of friends and relatives. It's near to shops, being near to owner, they liked being near to owner occupiers. Um, parks and sports facilities were mentioned, and 50% of the residents thought that there was a good sense of community and the identification with them. Their dislikes were drab houses, the traffic, the area going down, rubbish in the roads, and poor road services. I didn't put it on this slide, but there were some negative, there were some racist comments, but um, we are talking about the mid to late so Okay, so, um, oh, yes, and there's a very interesting, you know, it's very difficult historically, you can get at the stats and you can get at odd facts, but, you know, um, there was that survey information, so that's, that's really interesting. And John Chinnery's book, A Boy from East Dulwich, is, is, a, is a very good read. And the website, Camberwell Borough Council, contains some wonderful photos and memory emails, because people have responded to this website, um, from people who've lived in the area and, and might be, you know, far from places about, about the world. But they remember the area and they talk about lots of corners, especially the sweet shop opposite the Heber Road School, sorry, I missed this the, the rag and bone cart, life being hard, relatives nearby, households moving, but sometimes only across the road, no fitted carpet, no central heating, and some people were in um, houses that had basements that had been businesses, as opposed to there being a bread oven in the basement. You get a sort of sense of what it was like in the 1970s, even if I can't remember what it was like. And it wasn't all grim. There was um, there was carnival time. Um, and um, I don't know, I seem to have flicked over on my slide. So, so ending up with carnival time in the mid 70s. We moved to the 21st century and running out of time. So um, my next slide is, it's that corner of Pennock Road again. And this time it's a house now. It's got the front windows, it's still the same street. Um, it's still got the advert on the brickwork on the side of the house. And in looking at the area um, from, in this current era now, I've been sort of asking myself, well, you know, okay, I was there in the 70s. Is there any um, any apparent legacy, uh, apparent, you know, in the study area, despite all the history of negative comments and threatened demolition of plans, um, the housing is still standing. There's very little new builds 
uh, infill housing in my study area, indeed in the whole of that, although there are interesting uh, infills. Externally, the properties are very well maintained. Residents interviewed pointed to potted olive or bay trees by front doors, sometimes new tiled front paths and new slate roofs as evidence of gentrification. Internally, um, the lounge middle room in many houses has already been knocked through, but the further indication of some gentrification is that there are loft conversions, kitchen extension, new windows, mainly in the original sash love, and plantation shutters. And I have to say, some of the houses I've been into to interview people are now like the TARDIS um, inside, whereas other houses still have the original layout. Some even have evidence of the outside WC. The terraces and the semis and the three-storey corner houses all look like the original Victorian street scene. But inside, hardly any of the Victorian features survive, even though people wanted to live in a Victorian house. And there are more trees in the area. So we've got Rodwell Road in 1973. And the same terrace, and looking down towards the houses at the end of the road, we've got many more cars parked, and we've got many more wheelie bins, um, which spoils the view, doesn't it? But there are many more trees in all these Dulwich roads. So, you know, starting, making the area less drab was the wish of, of the 1970 residents. And the study area is still mixed young, middle-aged and the older households, lots of children and people from other parts of the world. While there were only 25% white collar workers in the 1970s, more professional households in my study area I, I interviewed. The occupations were still city facing, even if people were working from home and some residents are working from home internationally. Other residents working in public services and the voluntary sector and some households might be struggling um, because of the current uh, financial environment, but they're not poor. And some of the residents' views, it was a very, very specific choice to buy and rent an older home. Uh, I spoke to a couple of Americans and they particularly wanted a London home that was pre-Civil War. Residents, which is early Victoria, residents interviewed love their homes. Older households had moved to the area because it felt right. There was no indication 20 years ago, people said to me, that it would. Perceptions were of an established and safe community. People generally felt safe here feel safe in the area. And residents like and use the Victorian legacy of the parks, the sporting facilities, the shops, the library. It's a community that has evolved and it feels nice, said someone. And there's playing in the streets. Once a month on a Sunday, half of Rockwell Road is closed. And I've, I saw this at the first time um, at the end of last week. So, gentrification in the study area. There was no takeover by the middle classes in the 1970s. There was no strong evidence of property speculation that drastically changed areas in other parts of London through the winkling out of tenants. And by winkling out, I mean either harassment or financial inducement. It is the case that in some of these other gentrified areas of London, the housing was usually judged to have architect merit. People interviewed thought that it last year thought that the up and in the, my study area started around 2000. And it's interesting that in East Dulwich, owner occupation has not quite doubled between 1971 and, 19, and 2021. 
and in the study area, private renting halved from 1900 to 1971, and then halved again to 20. But social housing in the area has stayed about the same level. It's quite difficult to establish exactly how much uh, social housing there is in the area. But the council uh, that helped me said that only seven households have exercised the right to buy. So, reason for my um, my comment that it's dental dentation is that there has been a change. It's been over 50 years and it's been through replacement of existing residents over the long term rather than a drastic displacement in the short term. 1970s households like living close to owner occupiers, 2022 households interviewed like social renting in the area. New homeowners in the 1970s installed the basic amenities. In the 2000s, new owners are modernising and creating, or are hoping to, more space in their homes. In the 1970s, 32% of households had lived for more than 20 years in the area. In 2022, for the people that I interviewed, it was 40% who lived for more than 20 years, 25% between 10 and 20 years. So, to conclude, H.G. Wells in 1911 said, will anyone 100 years from now consent to live in the houses the Victorians have built? Fergus O'Sullivan, he's a, a writer for City Lab, and I think it's funded by Bloomberg's in the city, has looked at home designs that shape cities around the world. And he concluded that London is defined by the two up, two down. I've put in brackets terrace, row house. I think he might be American. And Mary Boast, some of you might remember, I certainly remember Mary, the borough's former head librarian, wrote in 1975 that East Dulwich is still an almost perfect example of a Victorian suburb. I think it still is. So going back to Dear Ruskin, how would he view the 21st century residents who, don't, who do not only love their houses, but also greatly enjoy living in, built up, East Dulwich in London? So I just want to conclude by saying and acknowledging and thanks to people who've spoken to me and, 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 and uh, helped me, and that's Brian Green and Sharon and Ian McInnes and Duncan Bowie, with all his books and Gavin Bauer, Councillor James McCash, I think Councillor for Goose Green, all the residents who agreed to be interviewed by me last summer and autumn, and Simon Smith from KFH Estate Agency, who I interviewed to get a feel for the local housing market.